is underglaze application. So basically what underglaze is, is it, it's not what turns out shiny, right? Um, it's a colored like clay slip, basically. Uh, you'll see that here. Um, there are certain manufacturers, there's a, we, we buy our underglazes from Amico, which um, we kind of have some loyalty to them. I've just used their products for years and so Stuart. Um, and they're pretty tried and true. You can make your own underglazes, but um, it's a lot easier just to buy them. <laughs> um, so they come in like, I think probably hundreds of different colors. We have um, a small variety of colors, but if you've ever taken any kind of color theory class, um, you know how to mix colors to make your own colors. Um, the nice thing about underglaze is it's kind of like um, a ceramic paint. So what you see is what you get typically. I say typically. Um, that can change different with different firing temperatures and things like that. So what you're looking at with this piece here is a technique we call Mishima. So basically what that is, is you apply a layer of um, underglaze on the pot like I did here. It's kind of like, almost like a gesso or a blank canvas now. So if I want my pot to be white, which is in my images, it was white. I'm gonna make sure I paint it with a white underglaze because these clays, especially this rods bod, it will turn out really toasty. Um, it has a lot of iron in it, so a lot of that iron will pull through the clay, which is totally fine with me. Um, but it might make my, my pot a little bit more brown than I originally intended. But that's just the nature of the clay body. Um, those are decisions that if you do f get further into ceramics, you'll have to start thinking about, like, the clay body affects how the pieces turn out as well, um, and the color of that and the different materials that are in that as well. Anyway. So I'm going to demonstrate um, how to do Mishima on my big pot here. Um, I'm also going to show you how to do Scraffito. So, so, so Scraffito is a technique where you carve through the surface of the underglaze to reveal the clay body underneath or um, another layer of underglaze that's underneath it. So I'll show you how to do that as well. You can use these underglazes like paint. Um, what I like to do if I am painting a surface of a cup, I like to put white on or base color on. That way, um, uh, you don't have like, you kind of have a more of a blank canvas. If you want to play, paint directly on the, the pottery, you're welcome to do as well. Um, there's some really good examples out there in the world of potters that kind of um, exploit the color of the clay in combination with um, underglazes. And I can show you guys some examples of what that might look like as well. So before I get started, I just got to decide what I'm going to do first. This is going to, I'm letting it dry just a little bit because I don't want it to be tacky um, because I'm going to apply a wax over the top of it and I'll show you that in just a second. So let's get started with Scafito. So I have a cup that is just leather hard. So remember I talked about leather hard where you can still feel the moisture. It's stiff. It's not bendable, but it still feels cold to the touch. Um, it'll be nice and easy to carve. So what I'm going to do is take, where my tools go? So carving tools for Scraffito, um, most common would be your needle tools, which you have in your kit. Um, these work really well as well, especially that hooked in to really kind of get some good scraping going on. Um, there's tools you can buy online specifically for this process as well, if you get really into it and really enjoy it. I don't know if any of you have ever taken a printmaking class. Have you ever done like a lino cut? You probably did one like in elementary school. Similar process. It's just you're basically carving to reveal your surface design. Um, all right, so a few things you can do before you actually get started. If you are um, unlike me and like to have a little bit of a plan before you get started, you're welcome to draw on the surface of this underglaze once it's dry. So you can draw on it with pencil. That pencil's gonna burn away. You won't see it. It'll just give you a nice guide to go off of. Um, other things you can do to kind of transfer a design onto a pot is you can create your own um, basically graphite paper. You guys know what I'm talking about when I say that? So basically you're gonna color the back side of a piece of paper with a bunch of, with pencil, and then you can trace basically onto the pot um, if you have a drawn surface onto paper, okay? So there's a, quite a few ways that you can get those designs from here onto the pot, okay? All right, so with Scraffito, it's really simple. So if I, let me find a pencil here. Let me draw something so I'm not just going blindly. I'm trying to teach myself to be a little bit more thorough with my 
demos because I always, I'm always afraid I'm, make, I'm boring the shit out of you guys. So I'm like rush and rush and rush and then I'm like, oh, wait, I skipped a bunch of stuff. So I'm gonna be slow. All right, so I'm gonna just draw, I don't know if you guys have seen any of my pottery. Here's an example. It's um, maybe considered inappropriate to some people, but I think of it more as body positivity and um, self-exploration and things like that. So a lot of my work features the female form um, in various um, ways on cups and things like that. So I'm probably just gonna draw kind of like a motif similar to that. So maybe I'll just like create some bands of something that's kind of like these breasts here. So the funny thing is my cup is kind of wet still. So I'm actually doing a little scraffito with my pencil. So depending on how wide you want your line to be will be the tool you choose to um, scratch away. So if I'm going a really nice thin line, I'm just going to use my um, needle tool here. So what I'm realizing though is that I'm using a clay body here. This B mix is kind of white. So I'm probably not going to get a lot of contrast between the white and the clay body. But that may be something I'm actually desiring. So we're just going to roll with it and see what happens. I can't blow on it. <laughs> I was about to go. <laughs> I've seen so many people do that in here. It's like, I, it's okay. I've done it a billion times. Like we just don't think about the mask being on our face. So you can see like pretty simple, nothing too complicated. You can get more complicated than that. So say I want to do some more, um, I want to reverse kind of this idea of carving. So I want the clay body to be surrounding what I'm going to be drawing. So just drawing boobs on these cups. I feel like a third grader. <laughs> So just like with printmaking, so if you want to use, if what you want printed is what you're going to leave uncarved. So if I want that to surface to show up, I'm just going to kind of carve around that. The nice thing is it kind of creates a little bit of dimension in your pot too. So if you chose like a Greek pot, this is probably the process you're going to use because this is traditionally what was used with Greek pottery. So that's why you're seeing that black and orange. The orange underneath is actually that clay body coming through. And the black you're seeing is actually a black slip or stain that was applied to the surface. Oh, this is like at the perfect state for carving too. So it, it's just a really nice, very soothing process. Satisfying. It is very satisfying. <laughs> So I often tell students too, like, if you've taken a printmaking class and like that's your jam, we can totally find something in here that can like translate to processes that you're using in other classes. Um, that's what I really love about clay is that anything you can do in another material, you can do with clay. So if you're a painter, you can paint on clay, you can draw on clay, you can illustrate on clay. You can build giant sculptures. You can do literally anything. Of course, I'm here trying to like sell everybody on it. Everybody be a major. <laughs> okay, and I might like create a little bit of definition here. <laughs> All right, so you guys kind of get the idea. So carving to reveal that drawing or that drawn surface. Um, another thing is like the reason why I have a bisque piece out here is you can apply underglazes to bisque ware as well. So this underglaze can be applied at literally any state except for when you have a clear glaze over it because it 
remember under glaze it goes underneath clear glazes okay um we also have um things that are called over glazes as well we will not talk about those at all in beginning because that just it's just throwing even more complicated stuff out there so um i'm gonna show you how you would go about doing this process this was from a student from last semester who really really just like locked on to this Mishima process and she did a wonderful job. So that's why I brought the piece back in here. She was a, she was an exchange student that didn't take any of her work with her. So she just left it outside and was like, great, <laughs> good examples left behind. All right. So what I'm going to do is I've already painted a couple layers of white underglaze on here. Um, ideally I would do probably about two or I won't see you say two. Do about three to four layers of underglaze if you want it to remain opaque. Um, once you put glaze on this pot, what happens is it kind of saturates that underglaze and kind of creates, um, it's almost like getting a piece of paper wet. It almost becomes translucent once it becomes saturated with that glaze. So you really want to put it on thick enough to where that does not happen. Um, and be careful of like, so you can see like these stroke marks, those are going to be even more obvious once I start getting glazes on there. Because this is a demo pot, I'm going to just go for it. <laughs> All right. So it's a little bit dry. Like obviously you can see, I can touch the underglaze. It's not coming off on my hands. Um, there are some spots that it's wet, but we're gonna go ahead and go for it. Uh, how long do you let the underglaze dry before adding another layer? Um, you just want it to be dry to the touch. Yeah, so if it's not dry, what you're basically gonna do is just wipe away all that underglaze you already put on. So make sure it's dry to the touch before you put on another layer, okay? Because yeah, if you keep going over a wet underglaze, you're just going to be just doing a lot of work that doesn't do anything. All right. Okay. So this is a wax resist. So um, we have this in the back. We also have um, actual wax we can melt, but we won't be using that for this process. How's it going, Doug? Good. Trying to squeeze all the underglaze techniques in one demo. I'm sure you can do it. <laughs> So over the underglaze, I'm just going to paint wax. Doesn't have to be thick. Actually, thinner is better because then you can actually see what you're doing. Just make sure you don't go over the wax too much or it'll end up with like a bunch of boogers from like basically the running the wax over and over. What does the wax do? So it's going to, res so what I'm going to do is carve through the wax and the underglaze and then I'm going to inlay more underglaze into that those like recesses that I basically created. And that's the process called Mishima. I'm just going to do a small section, but I'll have it all over eventually. The wax dries pretty quickly, so you don't have to do a lot of waiting. It will burn away in the kiln, so you don't have to worry about this green color showing up on your pieces later. So if you can remember, my, my original pot that I chose for the design was like a blue and white pot. Um, what I'm going to use obviously is the white underglaze and then I have this royal blue underglaze. It's not best there but um, it's one of my favorites and it, um, what will happen or potentially happen, I can't guarantee these things obviously, um, in the kiln is once the glaze is over um, the piece it'll start to kind of draw some of the underglaze out of those recesses and kind of create more of like a running effect. That's what I really want. So use black with this one. It doesn't quite as much. The cobalt um, in blues really reacts nicely to the glazes in the kiln. Always bring your brushes out. 
We have only a few in the back that are available for um, everyone to use, but they're really crappy because they're community brushes. So if you want to use nice brushes, bring your own. You don't have to buy really expensive brushes. Um, I usually buy pretty cheap brushes because I go through them pretty quickly. Okay, so I've got the wax painted on. It's still a little wet, so I'm going to sift that aside. So one fun thing I really love about underglazes too is you can kind of use it as a wash. Which I really, nope, that's... So do you guys know what I'm talking about when I say wash? Yeah, it's like a little bit of bath. So you're basically using it really watered down. And it really kind of falls into the cracks and crevices. So if you have something that's really heavily textured and you really want to bring that texture up, it's a good time to use a wash, okay? So I am going to use blue. Here. Might water this down just a little bit. It's a little on the thick side. Um, also, if your underglazes are as thick, just add water. There's nothing in them that won't that will affect that. It's really good to wash or water them down a bit too if you're going to be doing a wash because you're just going to waste all your underglaze if you're painting it thick and then wiping it all off. So I'm just going to paint it onto the surface. And I really want to pay attention to those deep crevices that I want any of the underglaze to stay in. Again, I'm doing this on this square, so already been fired. You can tell something's been fired if it sounds like that. The color changes as well. You'll see that your pieces go from this tan color to like an ugly pink. You'll see behind you there are some pieces there, Victoria. And most of your cups should be done firing if they're on that shelf. It doesn't look like there's any more cups on the shelf, so. If we we're missing some, is that because they're still They might be kiln? in a kiln. Yeah, it sounds like I can hear a kiln going right now. You hear that clicking? That's the sound of a kiln. <laughs> okay, so once that's dry, I'm just going to take my sponge and wipe it off the surface. And it's really going to kind of fall into any of that texture. It almost like, and you can layer these too to give like any kind of like so I've had students like, oh, I want it to look like rust. The easiest way to make something look like rust is layering the colors of rust. So black, orange, red, those sort of things. And just piling all of that on. Not really piling it on, but you know, layering. And you can wipe away as much or as little as you'd like. What's a lot of fun too is that you can really play with like what different glazes look like over different things. Really experiment when you're back there, okay? But I will say, make sure everything that you do on a cup, you write it down. You wanna know why? Because if it goes through the fire and you forget what you did and it looks awesome, you'll never be able to repeat that, right? So write everything you do down. Um, any glazes that you layer over each other, any under glazes that you layer over, or layer under uh, um, glazes, just make sure you're writing all of your processes down. It will be really hard to repeat it or not repeat it. <laughs> Nothing's more disappointing when I go up to a student and I say, oh my God, that's great. What did you do? Because like, I don't know what everything does together, right? And they'll just say, oh, I don't know. And write it down. I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> Thanks. Because like, even, that even helps me with my teaching. Like it helps me um you know see new things and 
give ideas to other students. So not that I'm asking you to do my job. Just always, always, always record your notes. Just a good practice in general. So you can see how that completely changes, like even like the feel of the piece, right? Um, and I can layer other colors. I can do like reds and purples and things like that and really like just play with the color. Um, but yeah, so there's another technique with underglazes. Am I overwhelming you guys? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> I bet you're excited to actually get to put like color and play with these things. Um, with the underglazes, you're welcome to use them in this room. Um, I would recommend if you can get a hold of like, um, you know, ramekins from like little plastic ramekins, you can get them from like a, I mean, shoot, you can even save them if you go out to eat or something. <laughs> um, hold on to those little things because they're really nice to mix like custom colors in. Um, you can pour a little underglaze, bring it in here and work on stuff quietly um, when you're not cramped in a small room. Um, the underglaze is totally fine to bring in here. We're going to avoid bringing glazes in here, obviously, because that could contaminate our clay. But underglazes are okay as long as you're keeping your, your space nice and tidy. All right, so I think, yeah, we're about ready to do some Mishima, which is really exciting. It's kind of one of those processes, it's like, ooh, <laughs> if it's done right. So let's hopefully this goes well. Okay. So you can do this without using um, wax. So one thing you can do is you can paint the underglaze on, do the carving and then fire, and then you can do the inlay if you don't feel comfortable doing it this way. There's always another way, it just takes a couple more steps. This is eliminating an, eliminating an entire firing basically. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna carve into that surface If you have a lot of boogers, just leave them until it dries and then you can go back with a dry brush and brush them off. If you sit there and try to, <laughs> you know, pick them off yourself, you're just going to end up messing up the surface a little bit more. So I would just keep them on until later and I can remove them later. This is the silliest pot I've ever made in my life. <laughs> For some reason, drawing it is changing it a lot than sculpting it. Okay, so I've got a couple little drawings there. So now I can start to inlay my blue underglaze. So you'll see I'm just painting it into those cracks. But look at how the wax resist is resisting the underglaze. So what's nice is like that's not going to show up at all. I'm going to wipe away any excess that's on top of that wax. It's like a stencil. Basically, yeah. Yeah, so it's yeah, it's basically blocking anything from getting seeping into that other white underglaze that I had previously applied. No, oops, oh, caught it fast enough. Started getting blue on the spot that I hadn't wax resisted yet. The nice thing too is like you can kind of apply, I know a lot of artists that kind of leave their, let their underglazes dry a little 
and kind of allow them to like become a bit of a paste and you can press it into those cracks and crevices if you want a little bit more pop. The painting should work just fine. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm gonna let that dry before I do any wiping away. Because if I if I let it don't let it dry before I wipe away, I'll wipe it out of those cracks and crevices. So I'm gonna let that sit for a little bit and then wipe it off. But you see how that works, right? So it'll allow you to kind of create an incised drawing into the piece. Um, and then later you can apply clear glaze over. And there's not a lot of spots. But if you look closely on this piece too, you can see how it's starting to draw a little bit of that black out, but it's not quite um, as strong. She, what she used over this was a celadon glaze instead of a traditional like clear glaze. Celadons are traditionally transparent but have a little bit of color. So this is an amber celadon, I believe. All right. And then one last thing. So you can use paper stencils too with under glazes. So if I'm looking at a pot here, let me go get a clean sheet of paper. There's multiple ways you can use paper stencils. So I can cut out shapes just out of regular copy paper, nothing extreme. Ooh, I've got an idea. Got excited for a sec. So you can use your damp sponge to kind of make this stencil adhere. Again, this will really only work on leather hardware. If you want to get real crazy with it, you can always make custom stencils like um, people use, you guys know what like a Cricut is, like vinyl cutting. You can use vinyl cutters to create vinyl stencils that you use over and over again. Um, there's a lot of potters that do that. Um, this technique, particular technique, um, would be a technique that Meredith Post uses. It's pretty simple. It's nothing too complicated, obviously. Just paper stencils. Hi Marissa. Hi. How's it going? Good. Good. All right. So I'm going to use that. Oh, and by the way, the red smells terrible. It just smells bad. Like there's nothing you can do about it. It's because of the, um, there's like sulfur, sulfur um, in the underglades and it smells like rotten eggs. So. <laughs> Yeah, reds and oranges are gonna smell terrible. Okay, it's not quite wet enough yet. So you can use that. That's really watery. As a resist as well.
Okay, so typically I would do three to four coats of the underglaze. Especially, it's so watery, I wanna make sure I really add quite a bit. So I'm gonna let that dry a little bit more. But you can see how that works to kind of resist that underglaze. So you can use that as a stencil as well. Um, I think I've covered it all. If I haven't, I'll show you. <laughs> um, but there's many, 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 many ways you can use underglazes. I prefer, instance, spray all of my underglazes. I would show you how to use a spray booth, but I think that's just going to be out of the question this semester because it's in such a tight space. Um, but if you do, or if you are super curious about that process, I can show you individually. Um, it's pretty simple. Um, it's just the equipment can be kind of intimidating because it's a big air compressor and all of this other stuff that you have to be responsible for. for. Um, but yeah, so any questions? So underglaze is just basically like paint for ceramics, okay? We just fire it on rather than just letting it simply dry. So once it's fired on and once we have a clear glaze over it, that's what makes it food safe, all right? So that's what makes that, that surface sealed tight and that bacteria can't live and reside in it. If you just have a raw clay body, it's porous, so what's going to happen is if you don't seal it off with the glaze, it's gonna create um, a harbor for bacteria, okay? All right, cool. Um, so once you guys have cups coming out of the kiln, you're welcome to play with some underglaze decoration if you'd like. Um, also, um, I don't think any of you are really getting very close to this point on your pots. You may be the closest. Um, so if you need a little bit of a refresher, I have the video, it's gonna be on uh, my YouTube channel. And yeah, I think that's all I need to tell you guys today. All right, cool, get back to it. Thanks. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw your eyes light up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I've been saying, like, I'm like very attuned to people's eyes lately, you know, because we have this. <laughs> But yeah, I'd be happy to show you how to do that.